Hey, and I think I think we're we're live, uh, or or live to tape, as they say. Nice. Yeah, that all looks right. Um, hey, everyone, <laughs> welcome to a brand new episode of Duck and a Bow Slash Fiction, uh, a, a podcast where we indulge Eat in our, our our masochistic <laughs> impulses to continue to watch the show Slasher. Um, not the podcast since... to see exactly what point we just decide it's not worth it anymore. <laughs> right, like when do we break? <laughs> is, is a fine question. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. It ain't this episode. Like this one didn't. <sighs> I don't know. Dude. It, it's it's not good by any stretch. But there are moments in this one where I'm like, ah, all right, slasher, you got me for this scene at least. Um, I, mm. and and if you ask yourself, is it the scene where there's a, a giant bloody cat fight in a kitchen? You are correct. That is the scene As, where it's yeah. like, this is okay. If the yep. whole show were this, now we got something. Once, yeah, w- once again, the the Aaron Martin shows his 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 depth and um, his courage in dealing with homosexual characters on screen, oh. like season on season. He just gets it. You get you know what? He just gets it right every season. <laughs> it's. Yeah, we'll get to that. That's right. Really... It's baffling. It's ba- absolutely baffling. I, it, there's no way someone can work in the TV or movie industry that has not come across a gay person. Well, it's not the the you know problem. I mean? Yeah, no, you're right. The, the problem isn't that you know we talked about this weirdly with Doug when we were talking about science craze, but like it's it's not just that. There's representation, which is great. Yep. Having having gay characters and non-binary characters and all that 100%, stuff. Hundred percent, that's totally great. great. The the problem is how you do that representation matters too. Well, yeah, is is it is it a token character? You know what I mean? Is it is it put in there because you're trying to hit demographics, or is it put in there for you know diversity's sake? And there is a that and that might some people seem like well that's the same thing. It isn't. Yeah. You know, having a token character in there is not diversifying at all. It's you identifying that you're likely to have a higher demographic if you just shove in a character that fits a particular niche market. And I, I, that's my that's my issue with, with how the writing the slasher is, is every time they try and broach these subject matters, as I do think on some level it's always with the best of intentions, but the way it's handled is just horrific. It's just real sloppy, you know. The, like yeah. the way to do it, I always heard at least. And and in fairness, I haven't written a lot of gay characters. Just it's not the kind of shit I do. But the thing I always heard is like, oh, you just write the character as the character, yeah. And then if you drop in a reference that they're gay, then that's fine. And that's sort of like, oh, okay. Well, th- this is not you. You are not identifying that person as a gay person and that is their yeah. defining characteristic yeah and it's one of the reasons i know some people didn't like them but it's one of the reasons and it's about the only thing i did like in halloween kills was little john and big john yeah yeah kind of fun clearly were a yeah. gay couple yeah, but yeah. at no point you yeah. know where they're like that as the only gay couple in haddonfield you know there was like none of that at all yes. um all right speaking of uh, halloween kills duncan we need to uh, we need to talk about some shit <laughs> So, Evil dice tonight, Bo. Uh, <laughs> something will. <laughs> um, let, let's talk about some movies, good and bad. This is how we begin every episode. You didn't go back to it, surely? No, 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 no. No, right. So, thank fuck. No, but let me just start with my bad. Oh, go for it. Because this is in the wheelhouse of a Halloween Kills, which is that newest Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie <laughs> that got unveiled. <laughs> Yeah, I've Netflix. not seen it yet. I, I'm doing it. I'm doing it with the uh, Baz is doing it as part of because we did the whole franchise mm-hmm. with him a couple of years ago, and um, he's locked that in. So I'm not watching it until the point that I actually physically have to watch it. So I, I have seen that as very, very, very. I was going to say fairly. Fairly is the wrong word. As uh, expectedly split the internet in half again. Well, it I, it comes down to what you want from a movie. Yes. If you want to see things get bloody, hmm. then 
the new Texas Chainsaw Massacre has gore. Yeah. If you want a movie that has a coherent thought in its head, that is where Texas Chainsaw Massacre falls down. <laughs> I did hear that the I, I know very little about it. Yeah. But I did hear that you know the, the survivor from the first movie vowed never to let Leatherface. You know, like about to track him down, and she stays one village across yeah. from where he is. <laughs> it's yeah. It's what if, what if that 2018 Halloween movie, but instead Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and oh by the way, the chainsaw fodder that we're going to use for the movie is a bunch of kids mm. who uh, have bought up this dying town. Yeah, and are. You know, a bunch of influencers and shit like that. Like the movie thinks it's pretty smart, and that's yeah. that's a little bit of a problem because it, it thinks mm. it's really got something to say. But when you start to scratch at it, you're like, "So what am I supposed to take away from this? Like, what is the actual ethos of this film?" Yeah, and it's like, "Well, I don't know, chainsaws, I guess." Well, uh, this is this is the thing, like, because I've seen like obviously there's a lot of people battling online about at the moment and I, I keep coming back to well you know it's i mean it's got the spirit of the original it's just gory fun and i was like there's not a lot of gore in that first movie at all it's it's yeah. all psychological and that that entire first movie is all about what it is to experience a nightmare and trauma and there's very little gore um if any and and that's that's the beauty of it your your brain feels like it's on fire watching it with all the stuff that you think is actually in it that isn't actually in it. The, the comparison I made, uh, at the risk of repeating myself, is that the original movie was sort of this cultural response to all of a sudden, in your living rooms, you were seeing kids being brought home in body bags because yeah. of Vietnam. Like, Toby Hooper was not shy about talking about the influence of Vietnam on that film. And mm -hmm. even though you don't see a lot of gore, it is, like you said, it, it is about the shock and trauma. Well, he, he didn't want, he, he specifically left the gore out because he wanted it to get, a, like, the equivalent of what, I don't know what is over there, but he wanted it to get, like, a U rating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, well, yeah, right. That's yeah, why I all mean. the gore's not in it, which is just terrifying. <laughs> like, yeah. He thought that, well, everyone, people will be able to take their kids to go and see this. Could you imagine four rounds to I mean, can I imagine? Yes, I can. <laughs> uh, but but you're right, right. Uh, you know, yeah. I mean, he was a little misguided in, in that sort of thinking. But the idea yeah. was, like, I, you know, without being didactic about it, I don't know that Vietnam gets mentioned much in the movie at all. Even no, though the movie no. is totally about Vietnam and and the effect. And also, here is kind of rural America and look at what a nightmare that has become. Well, and, yeah, that's and, the same argument that Craven used with the uh, Last House on the Left. Mm -hmm. and right. I, was like, I, can't, I can't believe anyone wants to chop and censor this movie when I can switch on the news and see things infinitely more horrific that are real. Yeah. And so, so that is, is sort of the, the thrust of, of the first movie of Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Then you get to this movie and there are threads of things like there is a character who is uh, the victim of a school shooting and All you're right. like, oh, okay, it's going to take a stance about guns. But by the yep. end of the movie, she's firing shotguns and all kinds of shit. <laughs> And you're like, guns okay, are good, right? Yeah, like, <laughs> so is the point of this movie that uh, this character learns that guns are cool, uh, uh, or is it that? Oh, oh, by the way, these kids who are buying up all this land in this dying town are, yeah, and with the intent of, hey, we're going to revitalize this town and like open up all these kind of businesses, turn it into, into sort of almost an arts community kind of thing. Yeah. Like, are you saying that they're wrong for that? Are you saying they're wrong because they're using cell phones? Like, Capitalism's what? bad, boy. I don't know if you know about this. It's, <laughs> speaking of cannibalism, this movie... I, eats, said capi oh. I said capitalism, but let's talk about cannibalism. Yeah. And, no, you're it's right. But it seems anti-capitalist, but also I, I, I don't know that it makes that case. Anyway, it's a bunch yeah. of just ideas kind of thrown at the screen. None of them resolve themselves. And the end of it is genuinely a real like, oh, go fuck yourself kind of ending. <laughs> and, 
Um, a, a lot of people like there's a a, a, a post credit stinger scene, uh, which I will not reveal. But a lot of people were like, "Oh man, it's so good! It's going back to the thing that I liked about the original movie." And it's like, just go watch the original movie. It's a yeah. it's fantastic. And just because this movie vaguely references it at the end yeah. doesn't somehow make this a good movie. It, oh. It's a real shitty franchise. I, like, I, I, was, I can't yes. remember how I was talking about uh, with this recently where I said, you know, like, if we were talking about the big four, I still think Halloween's my least favourite franchise, but I think just above Halloween is mm-hmm. Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah, and the first two are good for totally different reasons. Like, the, the yep. second one is just cocaine fuel bonkers. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's and it's, <laughs> yeah, and that's what makes it wonderful. Like, you know, Leatherface doing his little wiggle dance and stuff yeah. like that. It's just all that stuff is fantastic. And then everything after it is yeah. Part, part three has a thread of an idea which never really comes to fruition. Part four is just fucking nuts. Um, I mean, McConaughey and that is just it's a, been like, so long since I've watched. Dude, that. it's it's G, like you watch that and you're just like the thing is like McConaughey is great in it, but the character and everything else is just rubbish. Yeah. Um, and then you move into those remakes of which I didn't enjoy any mm. of them, and then that what the, the 3D one which was fucking nauseating, <laughs> and the 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 prequel which was pointless. Yeah. Um, what, what so, was the, was mean, it the 3D one that has the go get them cuz? Do your thing cuz. Do your thing yeah. cuz. Oh. Do your thing cuz. Which is like literally someone like it was like a 3D steel toe cap boot smacked me right in the balls. <laughs> I know. Uh, it is, you know? <laughs> yeah, it, it's a thing that hurts your ears to hear it and your eyes to see it. Awful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, oh well. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, you'll get. I, I'll be curious to have this conversation once you see it because you know I don't. I don't want my vitriol to to shape your opinion <laughs> of this movie. But when I finished it, I, I really had to stop myself and be like, "What was the point of that?" Yeah, you know. Yes, it, like I said, it gets gory, but if that's all you're in for, then let me introduce. There's plenty you. of other movies. Plenty of other movies that just give you gore. Yeah, so. let me introduce you to the works of Yoshihiro Nishimura. If you're just <laughs> yeah. looking for blood and nonsense, I yeah. can give you that. And have you ever heard of the Saw franchise? <laughs> like, <laughs> right. Yeah, you know I, mean? I mean this is this is bloodier than Saw for sure. It it oh, all right. it definitely tries to go some places, but it's again that's all you've got to like like you said. You know, it's all the people who are like, well, it's just like the original that was so bloody. It's like you. You need to watch the original again. The original has, I think, uh, I think it's Mark Kermode famously said the original has about a thimble of blood actually in it that you see, and everything else is camera placement and trickery. Right, and, and it's, it's like Psycho. Is it like when yeah. you watch Psycho for the first time, you are convinced when you watch Psycho that you see a woman get stabbed to fuck on screen, and you don't. It's all just very, very quick edits and very smart editing. Uh, by Hitchcock to make you think you see a knife penetrate the skin, which you never do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and yeah. Tom Hooper does the same. So uh, anyway, so that's my bad movie. What about what about you? Oh, dude, uh, there's so many bad movies. Um, so uh, the one I'm going to go with is one I'm actually talking about later today. Um, it's on the nasties list. It's called GBH or Grievous Bodily Harm. Um, it is a British movie, um, and it's it's fucking awful. This is all like absolutely awful. Um, it's kind of, I, I don't know if it ever made its way to the States, but there was a TV show in the 70s over here called The Sweeney. Um, and The Sweeney were all about, it was like London kind of geezer cops. You know, they all wore like leather trench coats. They're all like, this is the HIV boy, we're going to get the, we'll go get him, go get him down in Nick. It's all about <laughs> that. It's all shite. Um, <laughs> yeah. But they were like just on the edge of, of like breaking the law themselves and oh it's it was the Sweeney and it's kind of like the shittiest TV movie version of that. Um it's all about essentially there's get this I swear to God shit you know the, the benefit of this is it's one hour and fifteen minutes long. Right? All right, yeah, great. So, and you know like still and to be honest with you it f- felt about 25 minutes too long but anyway uh because it felt like an like an episodic version of a cop tv show except we're dealing with the criminals um so basically 
It's a guy that owns a bar um, and there's some London mob guy is making a move and, and muscling all the all the people out of their ownership of all the bars and clubs in London. And this guy's feeling a little bit like, oh, he's going to come after me next. But it just so happens, this guy that I know, no explanation as to how he knows him, that we're going to call the, the Manchurian, even though he's not from Manchuria, right, um, is getting released from prison today. And I'm just going to send this guy who clearly is like homoerotically infatuated with them, but they never like they list like scenes of them just like just having awkward conversations and running together in the park, which is weird. Um, but he he gets sent to to bring him out. This guy gets out of prison, and then there's a lot of driving around with bad music in the background as they try and track down this guy's wife who's left him and sold the house because he got sent to prison probably for murder, we don't know. And then he gets brought into this club as a enforcer, maybe. And then proceeds, like the next 40 minutes is like him just speaking to people. And then in the last like 20 minutes in the movie, they were like, oh yeah, there was a monster that was supposed to be taking over these clubs. We need to bring these scenes in. So you get like really shitty action scenes, like terrible action scenes. And then... The movie, and I'm going to give away the ending right now because the ending is fucking hilarious. In between you. all this, he makes a relationship with a new woman. Um, eventually tracks down like the, the the mob boss guy, kills all his gang, and then is reunited with his new girlfriend at this restaurant. And we're like, oh, it's a happy ending. And then the police show up to arrest him and take him back to prison. And I was like, all oh, right, so he's going to take him back to prison. Um, and he says, all right, you need to get Lydia or whatever her name is. You need to get women who we've only mentioned three times in this movie out of here. So she gets taken out and the police are like this. Police shot with shotguns. Police don't have shotguns in London. They're fucking like that. He, he's got a shooter! Uh, you know, like, he's got a gun! <laughs> he's got a gun! He's got, got the guns in him like that. Right, listen here, because his real name's Donovan, which they mentioned far too many times in this. Uh, like, Donovan, just want you to bring your hands up slowly, Donovan. Bring your hands up slowly. And he's like... And then he gets shot at the end, and that's the end of the movie. And I was just like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, what the f what the actual fuck? One, why was it banned? It's not violent enough or, like, gratuitous in any way or exploitative or even sleazy enough to be in it. Um, it's, but it's just been banned for marginally representing the, the medium of film. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? That is literally why it should be on a banned list. It is... It is just absolutely awful and it felt like it just <laughs> felt like every and there's a bit of, there's a bit of the the science crazed about it in terms of how it's shot oh wow and, uh, it's a lot of like cameras on me i'm gonna see my line it's got, now it's on to the next person who's gonna take it like three seconds to register and then they're gonna see their line and we couldn't just edit those bits out to make it seem like they were in a conversation a lot of static cam a lot of just like awful music and terrible dialogue. <laughs> they have like, a spotlight uh, as well. Oh man, it's just, it's just all right. All right. Well, let's now that we've put the filth behind <sighs> us. Yes. Let's talk about good movies. Oh. And I went back, Duncan, and I hadn't seen it in years, and went back and watched Kill Bill One and Two. Oh, dude, that's a good time, man. Oh, it's a fucking my good time. Goodness, it had been too long. And... The, 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 I'll tell you right now, those movies, for whatever reason, get better year on year. You're... There's something about yes. the craft um, yes. that just gets, like, I appreciate it the longer time goes on. Yeah, it. when I watched it again, I, I you, have to, you have to have those conversations. Like, I loved Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Yeah. I, I, yeah that yeah. movie just, it That's spoke incredible. to me. But watching this, I was like, and I kind of, <laughs> I kind of miss the really freewheeling, uber violent Tarantino. Tarantino, yeah. You know, and not that I mean, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood has its moments, but I mean, the, the scene. All, his, all how, these movies, to an extent, have their moments. It's yeah. Kill Bill's the one that that moment goes on for a lot of the movie. <laughs> so. Well, it's you know, you the the fight in House of Blue Leaves, and mm. you got you've got the the whole fight with l driver and yeah volume two that's amazing and it's 
it's just incredible. And I had kind of undersold how good Uma Thurman is in that movie. She's amazing. David Carradine mm-hmm. is so good. It, it, like you say, it's just this assault of, oh, this is great. Oh, this music choice is fantastic. Oh, yeah. you know, like, is this the best thing that Tarantino ever did? Well, this, it, like, see, when, uh, like, I, I get, like, offensively shot when people start saying, well, Tarantino is just a ripoff artist. He's just a career, he's a, a career director who basically takes bits and bobs from all the movies that he watches and puts them in one long movie together. And if that's what he did, I would, you know, I would give credit to the people that said that, but that doesn't make a movie. Right. You right. know what I mean? And, yeah. it's the same, it's the same way, and I get, like, very defensive when people are like that. Well, De Palma was just a Hitchcock rip-off artist. Is he? Right, he's telling, he's telling Hitchcock stories, but is he doing them the same way? Mm-hmm. Is he doing them exactly the same way? Because I tell you right now, if he was, it would be a bit more obvious to everyone about it. I think the, the, the stuff that works for me is where someone can take the bare bones of an idea or a theme and then build around that, their own personality. Um, and that's, Tar- that's Tarantino through and through and everything he does. And Kill Bill is his love letter, essentially, to those kind of exploitation, vengeance, and martial arts movies of the 70s. And it's, it's, and it's glorious to watch. And you get every, you're getting a bit of the, you're getting a bit of the, uh, there's like the, the Western style. You're getting tons of that Shaw Brothers stuff. Mm-hmm. You're getting, the fact that he even goes out his way to shove a whole slab of anime in there, like just flexing like a motherfucker. You know what? I'm just gonna. You want her backstory? Let's let's hit the anime. And it's just it, like to me, it just across about every every choice is just like this is mm, chef's kiss. <laughs> yeah, so. it, it, you're right. I think just because you're using the same vocabulary as the Shaw brothers and you know these are like uh, more not Morricone, uh, Carbucci, and yep. uh, you know a lot of these other directors. Just because you're using that same cinematic vocabulary doesn't mean that you're work. telling the you know same I mean? thing. Yeah, and also, yeah, yeah, like, right. like you shouldn't like if it was a case of oh well, he's copied this from this genre, copied this from this genre, and he's just put them together. It would be obvious that, that well, that just doesn't fit this because that's a different style. The way he manages to blend all that in seamlessly is what makes it like. Like he is honestly, I know. Like people of a certain age, we're in that demographic, bro. Um, and like Tarantino is going to be one of those guys that I think some people are going to think is overhyped, and other people are going to say isn't hyped enough. I genuinely think I don't. I've said even his worst movie, arguably his worst movie. In my mind, and I'm not I'm not including the four room stuff he did or anything, but his his worst movie you could argue is Death Proof. And I think Death Proof's a fucking great movie. So like you Yeah, know? <laughs> yeah. You're right. I, like what is his worst movie? Maybe maybe you're right. Maybe it is Death Proof, but I Death think Proof Death rocks. Proof is his worst movie. I I think his best movie to me, I always come back. I'd love Jackie Brown. I think Jackie Brown is uh, like I, Jackie Brown's one of those movies that I can just get lost in when I'm watching. I think yeah. it's just like uh, everything, and it's a lot more subtle. And I think that's there's a subtlety in the filmmaking that you don't see in any of it. Maybe Once Upon a Time in Honey uh, in Honeymoon in Hollywood uh, comes close to closest to some of those subtleties, but um, but yeah, I mean, uh, and then it's the fact that you're know, like. It's, it's two parts and you get like what like four hours worth of just fucking gnarly vengeance it's just and it's uh, the the writing is so fun and playful yeah. like even that scene in the the opening of the movie after uh uma thurman kills uh yeah. bernita green and the kid walks in and and the whole bit about like i you know i had no intention for you to see that but yeah. you ask anybody your mom had it coming. It coming. <laughs> and if you're still raw about this when you're older, mm-hmm. you come find me. I'll be around. And it like I know that that has launched a thousand fanships as far as like, oh, they're going to do a Kill Bill Volume 3. Like, don't even bother. Like, that's all I need out of that scene. Or yeah. the the owner of the strip club where Michael Madsen works yes. doing <laughs> rails with one of the dancers in his office and telling her as she's taking a toot, yeah, come on, be somebody. 
If yeah. that's how he convinces her to do coke is be somebody. And that whole scene where he's like, hey, you on the schedule, bud? Well, uh, yeah. nope, nope. You nope. not here. Yeah. Not on Wednesday. <laughs> Not on Thursday, you know, just fucking with them. It's so good. Like, but it, you're right. It, it like it's an exploitation movie, but it also has all these layers beneath it, like the relationship between Bud and Bill. Who, yep, you know, you don't. It, it's never a big deal in the movie. But the whole thing about him, like saying that he sold this Hattori Hanzo sword in El Paso, and oh, by the way, he never did. He had it all along. He just didn't yeah. want to tell his brother that, and. You know, what does that mean? And Bill himself, like, making the sandwiches and telling the story about goldfish being stepped on and all that stuff. It's just like, yeah. this is just a tour de force for one of the best filmmakers of our generation. Oh, yeah. I'd like, there'll never be another Quentin Tarantino. Absolutely not. It, it, anyway, I could go on and on and on because I watching those movies, I was just like, I know these movies like taken together this is a really long piece of work but also yeah. i just never want it to end because <laughs> it is so good it feels it it is so nice to be in the hands of a filmmaker that is this clever and playful and sure-handed confident. And, yeah, yeah confident I'm, right like, it's, just if like there's a there's it, that movie exudes confidence right it's a it, guy that just like he never made a martial arts movie before <laughs> Right. That's the insane thing about it. And he makes that that scene where she takes on the crazy 88 might be one of the best choreographed of the decade. Yeah. And yeah. that, that decade had movies like Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. You know what I mean? It's just it's it's like, same guy. Same guy choreographing that and yeah. the Matrix yeah. and all that stuff. Yeah. Like he got he I, I can't think of his name now, but yeah, he, he got this brilliant uh, you know, Chinese oh, choreographer. Dude, see, see when and... it goes black and white, and then oh man, and then see when like see when she fight behind the screen doors and the mm -hmm. colors and ah, uh, <laughs> too much. And you know, uh, go go the with her crazy mace and all of that yeah. stuff. It's it's just the best. And I love Uma Thurman like giving her an option, like, hey, my fight is not with you. If you want to get out yeah. of here, like I respect. And then you get you. The, the whole scene with her fighting. Um, uh, what's her face, Lacey? No, Lacey. Who's the who's our boss played by Bill? Are you no, no, uh... oh, 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 uh, uh, Lucy Liu, yeah, uh, Oren Ishii, yeah, or Oren Ishii, and then they basically do like a Lady Snowblood scene. Oh, completely, it's, it's, so good. <laughs> it's like there's no snow, like we've seen them drive into the place, uh... there's no snow in the to whole of Tokyo except in this garden where they're going to have yeah. this duel. And I'm like, ah, oh, just skeet, skeet, skeet everywhere, man, honestly. <laughs> yeah, there's that great moment when uh, Oren Ishii is, like, teasing her about, like, silly Caucasian playing with a yeah. samurai sword. And mm -hmm. when Uma Thurman gets that one cut in, and yeah. she's like, I apologize. I was, you know, I, I was being a little glib there. Yeah. And Uma Thurman's just like, apology accepted. Ready? And then... Uh, oh, it's so good, Duncan. I could go back uh, and watch it again right now. It's it's just <laughs> that movie is like w when I am on my deathbed and the machine yeah. is pinging beside me. <laughs> just throw that on, and I can at least die happy, you know. Um. Anyway, enough uh, uh enough effusive uh praise of a movie that is what fifteen years old now. Uh, is it older than did. that? It's older than that, I think. Yeah, going yeah, on twenty years. Thousands. Yeah, early two thousand. So, oh, it's so good. Anyway, what have you what have you watched that is better than Kill Bill Volume One and Two? Not better than, but I think it is worth everyone's time because I watched the first episode of it and then for whatever reason never went back to it. But there's a, a true crime docu series on Netflix uh, called The Sons of Sam, which deals with the uh, um, Summer of Sam, David Berkowitz, mm -hmm. and basically. What starts is, is super, super interesting. So it's a, about the guy who wrote the conspiracy theory book behind it. Right. Um, Proposing so that guy, there were two people. Yeah, Maury, Maury Terry. Basically, Maury Povich. Yeah, Maury Povich. Uh, it was Maury Terry um, who had this theory after looking into, just briefly, what, he, he, he wrote tech reviews for IBM, I think. Um, and got involved, like took a passing interest in the, the actual case itself, ended up writing for the Post, 
um, and kind of perpetuating the theory that there was more than one killer and then linking it to a group called the Children who were a satanic offshoot of the prophets or some shit who were uh, an offshoot of Scientology who were like, yeah, whatever it was, links to my, uh, to uh, Charles Manson, to like, just, like, it, it blew up, basically. The reason I didn't watch is because the first, it is a four-part four docuseries, and the, each of them is about an hour long. And I watched the first one, and basically the first one covers Berkowitz from the first killing to him being caught. And then I was like, well, I've now got three hours left to watch and he's caught. No, I didn't do that. You know what I mean? Like, because mm -hmm. I've watched too many of these documentary series where they're like four parts long or five parts long, and like the last two parts are like, what are we doing here? Like, mm -hmm. we're treading water, just padding this out. So I never went back to it. Yeah, I've seen Wild, Wild then, Country too. Yeah. I think, you know, you get to a point where you're like that. Mm, Wrap it up, B. Yeah. yeah <laughs> speed it up. <laughs> and um, so I, I, there was a couple of things that kind of drew me back to it. One, um, the voice of uh, Maury Terry, who passed away in, I think it was 2010, um, is done by, so he like narrates from his journal, I would assume, um, is uh, narrated by Paul Giamatti. So, I, I hard to argue. I, I love me some well, PG. You know, I'll, just listen to, I'll just listen to Giamatti talk. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I'd been, I recently did a review with The Baz on a BBC documentary series on uh, a serial killer in Scotland called Bible John, who was never caught. Um, and off the back of that, I'd, I'd said to Baz, you know, like, if you ever wanted to do another true crime documentary, Netflix has got loads in there. I mentioned that when I was like, I started it, but I never finished it. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to sit down and watch it. And it's a very, very, it's an incredibly interesting documentary, which the first, the first thing is, the first episode is all David Berkowitz. The second thing is the starting to look at, well, was there more people involved? The third episode is, I actually think there's a conspiracy here. Like there's some sort of like uh, like overarching conspiracy. This guy getting his book out and all the rest. The last part's the most interesting part. The last hour, uh, episode number four, basically starts the decline and downfall of this like Maury Terry guy who, you know, he he starts becoming very blocked to his opinions on things. So like he, he you know starts leading witnesses and all the rest when he's interviewing folk. And essentially his demise, his demise is like poor health and all the rest. But what is super, super, super interesting about it is how the last 20 minutes pivots the whole documentary away from the true crime subject matter to that of obsession. Oh yeah. Almost the, the zodiac yeah. move. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it really goes hard in with that zodiac stuff. And then it leaves you with a little stinger at the end, which I will not spoil here. But the stinger at the end is maybe he was onto something. There's a little detail that comes out post his death uh, in 2018, which gives a lot of credence because it was one of these things that was mentioned in his book that I think people dis well kind of dismissed very quickly. That was in some level or in some part proved to be true and if that was true then maybe there is a link and if there is a link then maybe it was all right all along um oh. a really really well put document one of the one of the great examples of this is exactly a four-hour story like there, there wasn't any bit actually when i was watching it was like uh what are we doing do you know just, who it, did it is it like a joe berlinger join or something uh, no 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 it's a um, uh dude has done stuff before Four. Uh, we're gonna have to. We're gonna have to fact check this, Paul. Um, yeah. it is, it's a name who uh, has done stuff before. Uh, Sons of Sam Doc, um, and it was done by. This is where we struggle. I know Paul Giamatti did the fucking Jesus Christ. So we'll have to deal with. Um, directed by Joshua Zeman, who is known for mm -hmm. Cropsy. Oh, Killer Legends he did, I believe. Uh, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, the the Killing Season and uh, Murder Mountain, which I don't know if I ever Murder watched. Mountain was... No, I did watch Murder Mountain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the one about the, uh, the cannabis growers. 
Yes, yes, yeah, they were yeah. just like, like, like if you went up onto their hill, you were dead. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, so that's who's behind it. Okay. It's All really, right. really, really, really well done. It's really well done. Cool. Um, yeah, that's and th- interesting. There's a good mix of police and friends of this Maury Terry guy and just people that were around at the time. Uh, but what's really interesting that like, like there's like uh like the, the friends of like Maury were all very much like this guy was brilliant and he was a great investigative journalist who pulled out all this information that no one knew was there and he brought it to the forefront. And then you get to certain cops that are like that. He was a cook, he was a crack, <laughs> he's like off his head. He was just making up stuff, he was just making up stuff to sell books. Um, and you know, it never takes a position, and that's what I love about it until that stinger at the very end. So it manages to toe a line right down the middle whilst being narrated by the guy all the way through it and gives you plenty of evidence on the other side of how this might not be right or how it could fall through or things he missed and then you get that stinger at the end very 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 well done the sons of sam is on netflix it's about four hours of your life but i guarantee it's four hours that are rewarding uh i'll give that a look man what a what a age of riches we live in when it comes to the murder slash true crime documentary there's so many good ones out there and yeah netflix um, netflix have done a lot of really good ones recently i think they had to like it used to be like hbo was the gold standard mm-hmm. for those but netflix really did raise the game granted there's a lot of shit on netflix we mentioned uh well well country which is a great documentary but does not need to be six parts yeah uh, that is a great a, three-part documentary that is six a hundred percent a hundred percent it should never have been any longer than that but the stuff they did on richard ramirez the ted bundy henry lee lucas the, the henry the confession killer the henry lee lucas documentary is fucking brilliant as well so yeah i'm just hoping that the they pick off more of the <clears throat> the, the big names and uh, serial yeah, killer. Give me culture. that Carl Panzram doc. That oh, uh, dead. Could you imagine? Could you I imagine? mean, I would love to before... see a, like an honest to goodness real documentary about that guy because he was a monster. And... Well, we're about to get um, Scorsese's movies coming out in November about H. H. Holmes. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, Murder in the White be... City is that what it is? Yeah, yeah. which should be like super interesting. Yeah, for sure. Um, I was listening to World War Z recently, the audiobook uh-huh. of that, and just wanted to go back and kind of revisit it. Um, because I was bemoaning the fact that there just aren't like good zombie movies and books and stuff anymore. And I was like, yeah. ah, let's go back to the well, you know, this is the water and this is the well, drink me. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the uh, I, I, I had forgotten on the audiobook, Martin Scorsese does a bit in world Mm. war z where he's the um the profiteering pharmaceutical guy that peddles phalanx the fake (laughs) zombie vaccine and it listening to it now it was like oh yeah this is you could just plunk in you know covid for the zombie thing and yeah Yeah, you know it's the same kind of thing it was it's really interesting though It it was fascinating to hear his voice pop up in that you know kind of coked up manner (laughs) <laughs> I never did anything wrong. Um, it was oh, it's so good. Uh, <coughs> pardon You're me. You're going to pivot us away from all the good stuff now. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of of so good, uh, let's talk about something that is not, and that is the third episode of Slasher uh, season four. This one titled "In Trust," and let's. Uh, we, here's the thing, Duncan. We're almost halfway through. We are, we are. I also want to say that I like depending on how your position is on this one. I I feel like my pick is right. Oh, that it, okay. That trend is one hundred percent. You think 100%. that that was all like she threw a goose or something into that chip? No, I think that's where I think that's where the body of the dude from the, the boat Quint. Oh, his body wasn't discovered, and all you saw was he what a like slug entrail or something yeah, hanging yeah. off the so like slasher usually shows you the whole body and if someone falls in a wood chipper slasher shows you someone falling into a wood chipper they don't just show you the result you know, of like, yeah and then it just so happens they find that they only find the, the thing they find in it and yeah I still stand by my orphan theory because I feel like there is nothing but evidence in this episode. There, dude, there is there is a split second in this one where she almost eats a human finger yeah 
when it's putting the bowl and she looks at that, and I'm like, she's going to fucking eat that finger. <laughs> like, Pika, Pika or Kev no, will yeah. eat that finger. We are going to we're going to go full cannibal here. We keep her away from the finger. I am just I, waiting I'm, for I, her. I'm even more convinced now that I'm right. Um, I still i I don't. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm saying that my yeah. orphan theory is also right. I. I <laughs> I've, I've said it before i think i'm right but i want you to be i've never so like overwhelmingly wanted someone else to be right about something i want this to be an orphan scenario i want our martin to pull an orphan that's what i want i i don't think he's gonna but I, that's what i want coming sir you just don't worry your pretty little head about it it's it's coming uh so <sighs> so we open on robin Getting railed by a subdued who is listening to uh, what can only be described as a Pearl Jam styled grunge knockoff on the radio. Yeah, dude, we couldn't afford Pearl Jam for this TV show. And if I was members of Pearl Jam, I I think that's the right decision. Yeah, it could. I mean, it could be Pearl Jam. It could be Jar of Flies. It could be. Uh, yeah. What was the uh, with arms wide open? The Creed. Creed could be a uh... Creed on your hands. <laughs> Yeah, well, he's he's uh, this guy's the the handyman. He's he's decorating a room and apparently decorating some, all right. Yeah, <laughs> decorating Robin's rectum. Yeah, he's got to he's going to leave his back like a painter's sheet. Yeah, um, he, pa he, painting he's, his he's, inner walls, if you will. Uh, uh, but yeah, he's he's getting he's getting like pounded, and uh -huh. they're in the zone. But then they hear a noise. And that noise is the sound of a massive sponsorship with Just For Men. Uh, <laughs> because, dude, that, I can't honestly. Every time he shows up, he's here's a slightly different color, and I almost wet myself. This episode in particular, like, we have talked about the die job that David Cronenberg has when they do these flashback scenes. This episode in particular yeah. is hilarious. Well, it's not the same color at any point. Yeah. Like he's and, supposed to like if you remember rightly in black here to begin with, and now this was like a a, a kind of missy brim. <laughs> like, yeah, it's it just... almost like an auburn color or something. And <laughs> so yeah, and like they hear this out, and Robin's like, "Oh my god, that's my <laughs> it's pop." And so he like, yeah, how old is Robin supposed to be here as well? I I'm assuming no a teenager, idea. clearly a forty five year old teenager, <laughs> like. <laughs> It's the fuck am I doing? I love any of these flashbacks. Like, there's a dinner table sequence, and you're right. It's like all of these people are 40 years old. What are yeah. they supposed to be? Well, they're talking about 20s? Wham, right? Yes, and George Michael, specifically early 90s era George Michael. We're so talking about so that's 30 years ago. I, you know what? Just cast different actors. Just get a hundred percent, a hundred percent. I know we have to bring them back. But, like, you just have him as an older guy. But Jesus Christ. Right. Like, have one of the characters call this younger actress Florence, and I will know that's yes. who it is. And 100%. She doesn't right. even need to look the same. And I, I yeah. will not... And like, that's the sort of continuity I won't give a fuck about. Yeah, I, I saw Black Coat's Daughter, a.k.a. February. I'm cool yep. with somebody looking different in a flashback. We can do that. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, so this die job David Cronenberg is standing in the hallway when Robin comes out still tucking his pants in. Yeah. And, uh... No, like, Cronenberg doesn't have, like, well, one second, like, Cronenberg doesn't know what's going on. Like, if I was Cronenberg in this scene, I would just think, my son's been jacking it and not been paying attention, but that's what teenage sons do, so I'm gonna give him a hard time and let him off. And everything would have been going fine until the handyman also comes out the room tucking his overalls back, and it's like, what right. the... Like, what the fuck are you doing, handyman? Yeah, and Cronenberg just very, you know, uh, condescendingly is like, you have business at the dock. Go wash your face, you yeah. filthy bastard. And kind of kind of takes off. And we cut back to the present. And we are reminded, like, oh, yeah, at the end of the last episode. <laughs> A human poor, being was torn apart. <laughs> yeah, poor Jaden <laughs> was, was yanked apart. And Grace is standing over his decapitated body you imagine you were watching this right without those break like a one long movie right mm -hmm. without those breaks in here you would have literally seen a person being torn apart and then seen a man's asshole being torn apart um so like, you know, we don't know scene. how loving it was there could have been lube <laughs> didn't look very loving more yeah, you're right, didn't live very loving. 
it did, it did not look like an affectionate yep. it, like they were not making love i guess is what we're i was saying. about i was about to ask your dog to describe how that love scene looked and the dog said it looked rough <laughs> he did that's that's johnson <laughs> for you um he's got a lot of opinions about slasher <laughs> By the way, you, you know, every now and again, when you make up a name for your pet, that <laughs> yeah. isn't the real name, but it's just a name. Oh, that yeah, I do it all laugh. the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The one that I've settled on for Johnson that it will crack me up any old time, Duncan, is yeah. I refer to him as Johnson Presbyterian Barkington the Third. Because I think it sounds real fancy. I started calling my, my, my oldest chihuahua as he's not got an issue with his weight. None of my dogs are fat, but like Dexter in particular has a tendency, especially over winter, just to put on a little bit extra weight. And I've started to re refer to him like he's a super villain called the Chubbler. <laughs> like when everybody walks in the room, I'm like, oh, here comes the Chubbler looking for snakes. Yeah, when I when I first got <laughs> Wonder Mud here, uh, I, he was real thin. Yeah, and more, much more so than now. And he he's not again not fat, but he's definitely getting a little beefier. Yeah, uh, just you know he's getting more comfortable and he's eating regularly and all that stuff. Just being a, a typical dog, and yeah. uh, and and if you look at the video, quite a biscuit. Um, yeah, but <laughs> yeah, he, he's gotten to the point now where I can kind of grab the scruff of his back a little bit more. Yep, and I like that he. Oh man, yep. Dog's got it rough. Um, <laughs> oh, rough life. Don't yep. get. Yeah, uh, Jaden got it rough as well, and that he was torn apart, boy. Yeah, and Dawn once again being the voice of reason, always yeah. on the show. And she is. She's brilliant. Episode, in this episode by episode. Again. Yeah. yeah, just becomes more and more the person that everyone needs to be listening to. <laughs> She's like, "Hey, we should get the fuck off this island. How's everybody feel about that?" Yeah. And everybody's like, well, we can, we got to find the boat and, you know, putting up all these speed bumps for this. You're like, no, 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 she's right. Everybody needs to leave. Like, yeah, you, you know, there is somebody on the island. She has been slashed already. You've yeah. got people missing. Now this has happened to Jaden. Everybody needs to leave. And so, so we do the Scooby gang split up. At right. This point. So Dawn and, and some of her crew are going to go try to find the captain and get the boat uh off the island theo and vincent end up staying with grace and pieces of Jaden, yeah uh as well as robin and then Liv, our you know the the prodigal daughter uh um, yes. is kind of leading everybody else because she's got the army trading and so uh, after they take off robin tries to comfort grace by saying we're gonna find the person who did this and grace is like you mean you? Yeah, you. You're, <laughs> you. you're the person responsible for this. Like maybe you didn't yeah. physically do this, but you are you are the reason that he died. Yeah, Grace puts this together pretty quick. Grace is like that. He failed his task, then he died. I mean Yeah. And so we we cut to Dr. Trin getting a Doctor Death. Doctor Death getting a description of the guy who stabbed Dawn and she's yeah. like, yeah, he was like dressed in all in black. He had this crazy mask uh, and a top hat. I know that sounds crazy. And how but does she know that? She wasn't there. Mm, yeah. All right. Uh, look, I'll allow it. I, cause this she wasn't is... in that scene. She wasn't yeah. in that scene. She was in the house in the house <laughs> at the time. And so they realized the boat has gone missing. Duncan. Yeah. There and is no boat. And so but not all... like that, he's, he's, he's obviously away from one of these fishing weekends that he goes away on. The only way to get off the island, we're letting this guy go fishing? Yes. It Look, it's a very loosey-goosey kind of household, <laughs> as we have learned. Apart from the games, which must be played even if someone's been murdered. Especially if someone's been murdered, yes. <laughs> um, and so they all go to the boathouse, and here live... I, I'm not sure how she knows this exactly, but she tells us, the audience, oh, we're stuck until Monday. Yeah. After Monday, you know, we're back. Uh, uh, another boat is going to come, and, and but we, we're stuck here for the weekend. Yeah. And, and they start talking about 
like the fact that the it's seven miles away from any island, so it doesn't have cell reception. And I love this. And like, yeah, uh, I think it's Florence says something about, well, my dad had a satellite phone, but I'll never saw him use it a couple of times and dons like that. Well, mission number one is we get the satellite phone. And I'm like, yeah. once again, I guess. <laughs> Dawn winner, has a winner. yeah. She has a great line here where she's like, "How on earth did he run a business on this island yeah. where there's no communication? What in the ever living hell?" And yeah, and that's the point where they're like, "Oh, he's got a satellite phone." She's like, "Well, then let's get it." What yeah, are, what like, why am I only hearing about this now? Yeah, <laughs> like, and so they take off, and and as you alluded to before, there is a bit of juicy intestine up on a rafter or something dripping. One and... tiny little bit, and it's all we see. And I wonder at the time, though, I wonder at the time, I was like, that's an odd choice of a shot. Yeah, well, and then, of course, we cut to credits, the wah, 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 slasher. <laughs> and <laughs> Autobots, roll out. It's 100% what it seems like. And so back in the house, it, it looks like the, the, the asylum of being a Transformers movie. And that's the sound effect. That movie uh, is called Transmorphers, Duncan. And <laughs> I have seen it. Cinematic gold. It's, it's what you expect. It's a lot of people sitting around a, a set that looks vaguely military. <laughs> where they're like, Get, put those Transmorphers on the screen. <laughs> it's terrible. The I I is the asylum still in business? It feels like they have been. Oh out god, of no! Asylum. I think like I think they just became sci-fi. Surely, right? They yeah, they just became whatever the production. Yeah, I think I think was. sci-fi just like did the same thing, and then the asylum was like, well, there's no need for us to do it anymore. They've taken on the mantle of shitty, they, shitty copies. I wonder if their name became so synonymous with garbage that they just changed the name of their business. I need to look into this. <laughs> I I feel like. There was too much money being made by the asylum for it to have completely disappeared. It just had to I mean, if there was else. ever an advertisement for the mob launder money through filmmaking, it was the asylum. It, right. Surely. It's Surely. All, all Bitcoin now, Duncan. The asylum is <laughs> yeah. entirely asylum coin. Uh, um, but yeah, so we go back to the, the main house. It looks like everybody's here. Yeah. Uh, Florence has found the satellite phone, but it's all busted. Yeah. And people start grilling Dr. Death and Dawn is like, Hey, maybe your crazy ass dad hired a killer <laughs> so that if you lose the competition, then he takes you out. She's literally cracked the case. This is what I think has happened. This, I, I think, I think. This is exactly the premise of this season. I think he's hired her not only to kill him, but I think he's also... We're going to get something about Trin's backstory where she was like an assassin who spent like time like, like in war-torn fucking Africa or something, just killing everyone. She like trained under Steven Seagal or some shit like that. But I'd like, I, I swear... My theory, my running theory now is exactly how she put it out. I think he hired her to administer the will and as part of that, the losers were to be eliminated. She, maybe he didn't necessarily say eliminated as in death and maybe she's taken liberties in that, but um, yeah, she's went into business for herself, is what I'm saying, right? And that started with Cronenberg dying and now she's just off the fucking rails, right? And all this, all this scene coming up where she's like, oh, don't hurt me that. She's faking it, Bob. She's faking it because she's got a plan. And our plan is fucking genius. <laughs> so uh, I'm down for this. Yeah, again, so long as my orphan remains, I don't care. <laughs> I don't care what else is so, happening. So long as in one part of this, she tries to seduce, well, she can't seduce Robin now, but she tries to seduce a much older man it's, and then reveals that she's actually 62 yeah um, it's yeah. gotta be like vincent or theo is who yeah. she'll try to seduce but anyway speaking of vincent at this point he proposes that they make a raft and everybody wisely is like that's the dumbest idea we've heard yeah. so far who yeah. who in this group do you think knows <laughs> how uh, no knows shipbuilding you know and also uh, i think it's Liv who says like oh it you know we're 30 miles away from any other yeah, island. Yeah, like that. The, 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 water, the, the water's pretty bad out here anyway, so, you know, yeah, you right. wouldn't survive. You wouldn't survive, so. And Trin, a.k.a. Dr. Death, says the competition has to move ahead, regardless of yeah. all the murders and uh, assaults and whatnot. 
And Theo, again, much like Dawn being a voice of reason, is like, well, everybody's sleeping here together in this room tonight then because we don't need to split up because that's how people get murdered. Yep. And so everyone's like, great idea. We're all going to split up and go get our shit and then meet back here. Yeah, we'll, 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 all go, we'll all go get a, like a shower, change of clothes, a snack, and then we'll all come back. Yeah, and I don't even remember what she does in this scene. I just have a note saying, Afra acts weird as usual. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't like it. Something about, well, they're talking about killing and stuff like that, and then she's like, ah, she has to put her hands over her ears and yeah. Robin's like that. I'll go and make you a at like a warm cup of milk and you can get your first sleepover honey oh yeah uh, speaking of so robin uh, 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 robin like robin like, the, like slasher has no way to write a character who you can sympathize with for more than 30 seconds i and also i hate this stupid reveal but it's a it's a terrible reveal it's a, like i would have preferred it just be cronenberg Right, which may all right. So Liv ends up finding Robin as he's making this warm milk for his orphan daughter. Yeah, and she asks, like, "Hey, did you know about my birth father? You know, being David Cronenberg? Because if you did, I like I thought we were close, and yeah. I figured you would tell me that." And Robin's like, eh, "It was. It's complicated. You know, Facebook hashtag complicated." And <laughs> Robin says, "Look." If this is about the money, if this if if you're asking me this because you want to get your part, then you can just cut the shit right now. And she's like, I don't care about that. I just found out that my father was David Cronenberg. I just want to connect with my family. Like I just realized you are my brother now. Yeah. And of course we're gonna find out that's not the case, but right. And yeah. He, and the most stupid, clumsy fucking way. Oh, it's the so he tells her, though, well, if that's all you want, you should drop out of the competition. If the money doesn't mean anything to you, yeah, then just drop out. And she's like, well, this is impossible. I can't even have a conversation with you right now. And so she takes off. And this well, was he the, said, he on. says he says a line specifically about was it like something like my dad was right when he said that you know you cling on for absolutely everything or you'll like. Like whatever, like whatever the term is, is he really kind of dismissive class of sort of um, sort of statement? As if you know, like you're beneath me, and you're just that, that. Your whole purpose here is to get money, and my dad was right all along. And I'm like, based on what? Based on <laughs> right. wanting to have a relationship with a relative? And this Fuck was the this guy. Yeah, I, this was the point in the episode where I was like, oh, Robin dies this episode. Okay, got it. Oh, yeah, got 100, it. 100, like, when we saw him getting railed at the beginning, he was dead. Yeah. So, I like that's where the suspicion was. But as soon as yeah. you have this scene with yeah, yeah. Liv, you're like, oh, you're you're completely yeah. gone. But then, then this, like, th once again, this episode is going to try and straddle me, trying to make you have sympathy for Robin and at the same time, absolutely fucking hating his guts. In a way which just never feels like either side is particularly measured. Um, because we get more. We get, oh, dude, we get the next twist. So right, we're right. dealing with, we're, we're, we're dealing with, this is that, I mean, shots fired everywhere. We, <laughs> we are like cluster grenade in every topic we can get. So we have had, um, we've had like a, a brief talk about, like, a, a brief dalliance, if you will, about homosexuality, which will come up more often uh, in, the, in this episode. We're now having one about specifically a class divide between the Galloways and the, the help. Uh, and even if you are related, you're still the help and you shouldn't get anything because you're not, not like a true blood, so to speak. And then we pivot into the next one. Slasher plays the race card. And I, 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 I'm surprised you didn't hear me in Nashville. I face Pam so fucking hard. This scene, could man. I could not believe it, dude. I could not believe it. So, gr while Grace is weeping in her room, Duncan. Over her, you know, dismembered child. Sure, as you do. Yeah. And Liv's mom rolls in with some food. Yeah. And she, uh, Grace ends up apologizing to her, to her about, like, I, you know, I've treated you badly. 
Um, I could have done better. And great. Uh, Liv's mom is like, look, all of us could do better in this situation. Yeah. But the the problem is this family. This family yeah. she she <laughs> describes as toxic, and says they, understatement <laughs> naturally. And then she says, you know, it's not that they don't like poor people. They don't like black people specifically. They literally just say that. Yeah. And that's just a, that's a sentence that just comes out. So Cronenberg married a black woman. Yes. And then fathered a child with a black woman who he was grooming to be the heir apparent, who had them on the board and all the rest because he hates black people. That's more. right. That's the best way to enforce your racism. Yeah. <laughs> it's, <laughs> like, right. it's just so fucking stupid. <laughs> Corrupting from within, right. You, you pretend to be an ally. And and so these two characters are like, well, we need to watch out for each other being the only two people of color on this island Left. other than Dr. <laughs> Trin, who yeah. let's be honest, is too creepy to be one of us. Yeah, she like well, she is the Grim Reaper, so right. um, we maybe don't maybe we don't make a deal with the Grim Reaper. Yeah, that sounds like a good plan. Right. So in this twisted Big Brother house, yeah, we have an unlikely alliance between Grace and Liv's mom. Yeah. So we have there's like lots of mini factions breaking out. That's one faction. There's another faction which is obvious twins, Theo mm -hmm. and Vincent. They're in a little faction. Uh, Liv and Theo also in a kind of adjacent faction mm -hmm. so to speak uh don who will get into a faction later on with o'keefe um they're kind of buddying up and that kind of leaves robin by himself which isn't going to play it well in this it's, episode Bob. it's just robin and afra and uh, robin, robin and creepy orphan child afra right and uh and the orphan, who yes. is certifiable well, she's fucking nuts, Bo. <laughs> like, there's no getting around this. She is absolutely fucking nuts. All right, so her scene is next, where she goes outside to find Dr. Death outside smoking. Uh, holding an axe, though, which yeah. is just... How very shining of this whole fucking thing coming up, by the way. <laughs> Dread! Dread! And Florence is like, hey, we need to get off this island. And Trin yeah. is like, look, let's be honest. First of all, you're never going to make it through this competition because you're an awful person and you're yeah. going to leave this island as poor as when you came to it. Yeah. And you know, the reason that you're going to lose is because based on the rules of this competition, your father is forcing you to work for something for once mm -hmm. and you are incapable of that. And Florence is like, Oh, incapable. Am I? Well, <laughs> ha did you notice my ax? Yeah, and then straight up chases her through the woods. Yeah, and and Trin is like, "You're the killer! You're the killer!" And Flo uh, laughs at her uh, for running. Oh, it's the most fucking pantomime laugh. Yeah, okay. Chases her to some giant ass industrial wood chipper. And yeah, you know it's you know it's like a huge wood chipper when there is an actual set of stairs attached to the side of it, like how you board a plane. Yes, right. Like <laughs> that's how big this fucking thing is. I Where? thought when it was, I thought it was like a substation or something. When she ran up, uh -huh. I was like, oh right, is that the like? No, 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 no. It's a, a wood chipper. But and and Florence gives her shit like, wouldn't you know? You ran to a wood chipper, you you stupid doctor. Ran to a wood chipper almost as if. She planned it, Bo. <laughs> so, just seeing. I, I look. I'm with you. I Dr. want this. Death. I want Dr. this. To, I want this to be true. In the same way you want the orphan to be true. I want both she of them. One hundred percent is going to kill someone. Fucking audition style, but <laughs> like when <laughs> acupuncture, oh, yeah. she's going to fucking do it with surgeons and needles. I, I can't wait. Oh, now now you're speaking my language, <laughs> and so. As they both kind of left, like Florence, uh, Florence is like, "Oh, you thought I was going to kill you, ha ha ha!" And Doctor Trid gives like a nervous laugh in response of yep. like, "Oh yeah, I thought you were crazy, but turns out you're just kind of crazy, as opposed to fully crazy, playfully crazy, yeah, as opposed to maliciously crazy." And then and, Flo's like, "That's what you think." Yeah, and she just throws a log at this woman's head and knocks oh, her oh, in theory, oh. right. <laughs> She does a real whoa, you know. Yeah, and this is how I know she's not dead because 
this is Slasher, and the one thing Slasher does is death. And we don't see legs dangling, we don't see anything, we just see the end. Right. And just some blood spitting out. Right. And Florence... Jane dead. Yeah, Florence hit the, hits the switch, a bunch of blood comes out, done and done. Then we cut to the orphan, <laughs> who is is like all curled up with Robin. Um, and is like, uh, are we going to be close all night like this? And he's yeah. like, uh-huh. And she gives him a creepy orphan hug. Yeah. And you're like, oh, she is so orphan. She's like, baby wants to fuck. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's there. I, I get it. Fucking huffing for. Yeah, I like that this has got blue velvet. Like yeah, she's 100% Frank Booth. Yeah. That's what's happened. <laughs> She's oh, orphan it. wants to fuck. And <laughs> he goes. Robin ends up finding Dawn poured herself a drink. God bless her. Oh, yeah. It's like, pour me one, Dawn. Yeah. <laughs> oh, after this show, we'll need one. And he asks Dawn, he's like, so you say that you love me and you'll stay with me through anything? And she's like, yeah, my only concern is that you're acting crazy right now. Yeah. And, you know, to be totally upfront with you, I'm worried that you had something to do with Jaden's death. And he's like, no, that's not what I'm worried about. I'm worried about the fact that bum, 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 Liv <laughs> is my daughter. Yeah. And uh, then, like, Dawn naturally is freaked by this. And he's like, see, I told you that you didn't love me. And she's like, will you give me two seconds? You just told yeah. me <laughs> that you have secret daughters. Yeah, and after we couldn't conceive. Right. We The reason we got this creepy ass orphan kid yeah. is because we she's couldn't have a baby. Going, Hi. Right. She's like fucking eating, a, eating a, like an ornament. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. And so she's like, you're just going to have to give me a couple of minutes to process this. Yeah, I'm not saying I'm anti you having this other daughter. Like, uh, Liv seems fine, yeah. but I just need to wrap my head around the fact that that is my stepdaughter. Mm -hmm. And so we get another flashback to a dinner seat. <laughs> Cronenberg's hair is a slightly different color again. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And this is the bit that you mentioned earlier with, with George Michael, where... All of these, in quotes, teenagers yeah. are debating the... This is Florence. Yeah. Is at the table. Um, Grace, Grace is there. David Cronenberg. David Cronenberg. Robin. Yeah. And Liv's and mom is kind of hovering around. She's hovering around about to serve, to, but we're going to come back to that, which is going to once again link to the classist nature of you know the family. But... <laughs> The way we know this is the nineties is one the fashion because Robin's wearing like a like a woolly jumper thing with uh -huh. a chain, and that's what we all wore in the nineties. Um, uh, but two, also we're talking about like early into the George Michael going solo career, yeah. and Cronenberg struggling to get his head around um, the the you know the song Freedom. The fact <laughs> like, that they are name checking Freedom in particular, by the way. Fantastic song. Great fucking song off a great album. Yeah. Um, it was uh, uh, Fincher did the video, as a matter of fact, right? Yes, yeah. indeed. So yeah. They forgot. All comes together. Um, uh, but yeah, like, the, but like, like, but <laughs> Cronenberg is like basically taking the longest road ever to basically coming out and saying, I think George Michael might be gay. <laughs> like, <laughs> so you, after kind of <laughs> implying that, Ben gets real specific and tells yeah. Robin, why don't you just come out already? Yeah. And this is the point where the conversation is broken up by Liv's mom serving uh, gazpacho. Yeah, gazpacho, which, by the way, out there, is not a common soup by any stretch of the imagination, but it is a fucking cold tomato soup. Yeah. And so, as they're as they're serving around grace says oh this soup is cold lives mom and yeah. everybody at the table abandons their concentration on 
Robin's sexuality yep. to just point and laugh at Grace well, for being is, right. so stupid to not know that Gaspacho is Sir so Cole. why right like, like Cronenberg Cronenberg to me feels like the sort of guy from the conversations we'll hear later on specifically about the the sexual encounter with the help um, that he is purposely wanting to make sure that his money stays amongst the you know the the particular blood and class type mm -hmm. right of of himself how he sees himself like you know this elevated status so how is he in a relationship with grace then right why is he not standing up for his wife like i i don't understand this does he see her as a gold digger like that's the thing we don't understand you wouldn't have a kid like you wouldn't have a kid like after the fucking chewing out he's about mm -hmm. to give robin you wouldn't have a kid it's just it's all wrong doesn't make sense i'm sure that when we get to the episode in which grace is murdered and we get all the yeah. flashbacks to explain <laughs> that there will be something to offhandedly 17 different rinses the 17 rinse the hair rinses of david cronenberg is the name of that episode <laughs> it's yeah it's like the 99 fingers of dr t or whatever <laughs> i'm waiting for the moment when he goes full giuliani and just starts dripping down the sides right uh, <laughs> Th you know this I mean? next scene will be in front of a landscaping business. <laughs> um, yeah, it, and so we cut back to the present where everyone's kind of crashed out in the living room. And David Cronenberg wakes everybody up with a Brewster's Millions video that he has recorded. Yeah, a la Saw. Yeah. This I, is I a Yeah, It's 100%. It's like, ah, you have survived this game. Although the funniest part of this is that he assumes that Robin was the one who lost the yeah. last competition. Yeah. Yeah. I, can't, I, can't, I can't imagine there's any way that you survived. And he says that whilst, you know what I want to see when I'm making my, this is my, uh, this is my way to kill off my family death challenge will video. I also want to have a massive glass of whiskey that I just power chug while I'm talking. <laughs> Because he does, he's like, he gets out less than a sentence and he's like, yep, this script's terrible, gonna need another one of these. And you know that that's the real shit that's in this glass as well. Just right there, let him loaded <laughs> while you're telling your family how much they suck. That's the best day yeah. ever. So, and we, and we all should live long enough to be able to do that. Right, right, just to be like, look, and another thing. <laughs> For, you know, Robin sucks. Everybody agrees Robin sucks, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. All right, well, let's move on to the next game, which is which going to be in the basement. Yeah, so we're going to do the next game in the basement. Theo then realizes, like, oh, where is Dr. Death? She is now yeah. missing. And, um, yeah, there we go. Um, <laughs> you, you switch sides on me for some reason. Uh, on the on That's the what I do. I'll yeah. do it and and the drop of a hat, bro. <laughs> yeah, you turn coat. And so <laughs> everyone decides, okay, well, we've got time before we do this basement game to go looking in the woods for Dr. Trent. Yeah, let's go out in the dark when there's a serial killer on the loose and let's go and hunt someone. In the dark, <laughs> in the night. Um You ever seen blood in the moonlight? Kind of looks black. <laughs> so <laughs> they end up uh, Liv goes off kind of on her own and ends up getting surprised by Vincent. Yeah. And they're kind of chatting and Liv is like, I never should have gotten on this boat. This whole thing was such a terrible idea. And Vincent says, oh, well, Robin should have told you um, yeah. what's going on. And by the way, I just want to apologize on the behalf of all of these weirdo Galloways. I'm sorry about this. Yeah. And if I don't win, I hope you do. And she's like, something, oh. right. Something about him. And yeah. then he takes her by the hand. Yeah. And holds on to it like an uncomfortable amount of time. Yeah. And finally she just jerks her hand away and he says, oh, do you not like that? Is it because I'm not Theo? Like, I see the way you look at him. Yeah. And then she just decks him, Duncan. Just yep. uh, like gives him a straight up punch in the, in the puss. And says, you need to stay away from me. At which point, Liv's mom and Theo have come upon the bloody wood chipper, where Theo recognizes like a bracelet that 
Dr. Death was wearing. So he's yeah. like, oh, this is obviously trend. This is obviously staged. Um, it's, it's, <laughs> right. So they'll assume uh, that. that oh, I'm oh, come on. Oh, come on. It's so fucking staged. Um, so, so staged. She's playing them like a fiddle bow. She's playing <laughs> them like a fiddle. So, I, I again, I hope you're right because that would that would mean that every episode or every season of Slasher, we have known the killer at about episode two. <laughs> yeah. So it feels good that our track record would be intact, and I I still stand by my orphan. Um, <laughs> I'm not saying she's the killer for everything, but she is a hundred percent going to be revealed to be an orphan. I I, th- I like I, I think. Even at the end of this, if I'm proved 100% right, I think we can just revisionist history this and just say it was the orphan enemy. Yeah, when it, when it happens in episode six, Duncan, when they <laughs> revealed the, like, the flashbacks we get of Afra, you're going to be like, son of a bitch, we got orphaned. Aaron Martin orphaned us. Um, Goddamn Aaron Martin. Uh, yes, yeah, sneaky creative, son of a bitch. Creative genius Aaron Martin. Ne- never saw a movie he couldn't rip off. <laughs> <laughs> so, so back inside the house they decide like oh clearly a a killer is still afoot so we're gonna lock up all the doors robin uh wisely at this point is like hey you know when, when my wife was saying everybody should you know kind of centralize and theo said we should all sleep in the same room i agree with all of that now and everybody should stay put yeah and so then we get this cut well, Florence decides that she she's like me, Bo. Like when you're like when you've got nothing to do, you've got plenty of time in your hands, you get a bit snacky. And there's no better time to snack than late at night when everyone's snoozing and you think to yourself, you know what, I could just go to that kitchen and make myself a fucking sandwich. And I'll tell you right now, ain't nothing hits the spot. Like he, and she grabs, there's like a, a like a bottle of wine. She is going to town. This is gonna be the best. Late night supper sandwich ever. When she turns around and Liv's mom is there and she yeah. drops like the bottle of wine or some jar or something. Yeah, she dropped the, the, the wine smashes. She drops everything in there. She's like, the what? It's the line. It's the line that comes out of her mouth. I was like, that stab her in the face. Yeah. She like, goes, clean up on aisle five. I guess you need to yeah. get to work. Like, you're going to make her clean up the mess that you just made in the middle of a murder situation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is unwise. Um, yes, and but then there's a there's like this trigger thing that uh, the, the one of the the only door at the kitchen locks. Yeah, and she turns around and Grace is there as well, and all of a sudden Florence is outnumbered. So in between this, yes, we get a quick flashback <laughs> to the dinner where Grace is getting violently ill. One presumes because of the gazpacho. I think she's been poisoned. A hundred percent she did, but Liv's mom absolutely fucked with her food. hundred percent. And Robin follows her into the kitchen and gives Grace this business about like, well, maybe your stomach just couldn't handle such rich food. Yeah. That you're, you have a much more common palate. And so this sort Once of- again, gazpacho is just tomatoes. As tomatoes, right. some oil and some garlic blend it up. So- And serve cold. <laughs> so, so after Robin gives her some shit, we cut back to the present where, like you, like you said, Grace is now joining the party. Yeah. And Lawrence, not reading the room right at all, no, Florence like has all the the grace, tact, and mental acuity of a dump truck. <laughs> is is like you know, uh, Grace. I I know you're upset about your kids, but don't worry. I would never hurt them. I wouldn't touch your kids to scratch them. And then she ends up stabbing Grace in the knee with a broken bottleneck of this wine bottle. Yep, and. And it's just a free for all. Like everybody, in all the- hell breaks loose. It's like the shittiest shit, shit, shit version of the aforementioned Kill Bill scene at the start of the first. Yeah, like the first, like it's like with like the household items and they're all getting knocked around. It's like a really shitty version of that. My favorite thing that comes out of this is there is a sequence where we get a bit of a knife fight, and then we get um, uh, the the uh, uh, the the maid grabs 
a fucking solid wooden butcher's block and smacks it off the side of Florence's head and yeah. she goes down hard, but not before grabbing one of those like meat holders. You yeah, know, it's a skewer. Blocks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And when she then stabs her in the foot twice. <laughs> not just once, but fucking she goes, ah, ah, my foot. Meanwhile, everyone's in the other room. Like here in a, like a what we would call in Scotland a bit of a rammy, uh, like you know, like it's just a, it's a, it was a you know, um, or, 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 or a great line that I once once heard is uh, I'm trying to remember who it was. So I once heard, but a bit made me piss myself. Um, where I know exactly who it was that told me this it was an uncle that once said to me that. He was sitting in his living room, and uh, you know, like you guys will have. Uh, I, I don't know if you have the same terminology for it, but artex. Artex. It's like a plaster. Artex is like a plaster effect that you put on your wall. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm not familiar, but I'm sure. Yeah, so it's like very, very common in the UK. Very common in the 60s and 70s. And his whole ceiling was artex, apart from this kind of molding around the light, um, which was all like ornate and all the rest. And um, th there was something upstairs heavy that fell off the top of a cupboard. I, I don't think it was a bowling ball, but it was something quite heavy. Uh, inexplicably fell off the top and smacked right where the artex was. And a chunk of this artex came out and fell and hit him on the head. And come up, <laughs> like in a shock. And the way he described it to me was like that. I was sitting, having a, Duncan, I was having a wee nap. And then all of a sudden there was a hurry, a bang. Um, a whore of a bang. Yeah. So a whore of a bang. That was how there's a whore of a bang, and then the ceiling came in on me. So I put my chair. So yeah, <laughs> so that's they, they were all sleeping in that room, and then all of a sudden there was a whore of a bang as people were killing each other in the room. Yeah. Jason. Vincent, um, you, by you, the way, use whore of a bang. Um, <laughs> you can use that in a sentence. You probably get away with it as well. The, a a having a bit of a Rami is the one. That oh, I really... a Rami. A Rami. Yeah, uh, yeah. That's a, that's a fight. That's a family fight. It's a bit of a Rami. Uh, so we're having that's a bit of Rami with me. <laughs> a, um, a bit of a Rami caused a whore of a bang. Um, it caused a whore of a bang. Yeah, that's right. It's a... So on his way, though, Vincent flashes the fact that he's got a gun. <laughs> he's got a gun. Exactly. <laughs> And Vincent and Robin bust into the kitchen, pull everyone apart. Yeah. And while they're trying to get the these women off of one another, Grace bites down on one of Florence's fingers. Oh, this is beautiful. And bites it off. Yeah, takes it clean off. And when when everyone looks at her, she's got blood all over her mouth, yeah. just looks wild-eyed and crazy. Yeah. And everyone stares at her and she says, don't look at me like that. You all <laughs> taught me. Yeah. And well, that, it, it's pretty good. But like yeah. I said, of everything that's happened so far in this entire season, this kitchen fight. Oh, this is the best, the best thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. The whole season should just be this. Right. Just have There's too many airs and graces. I like, let's get rid of the, if we're going to lord of the flies this, let's lord of the flies that. Right. Yeah. And so in the aftermath of all this, <laughs> O'Keefe puts the finger on ice, and this is the point where the orphan almost eats it. Afra like stares at it for a good long second, and then O'Keefe's like, "It's a real like, like I'm yeah. gonna reach you for." You want to go over there? Like so it's sitting there with like saliva coming down. <laughs> right, you you see from her point of view, and it just turns into a ham, you know, like a Looney Tunes cartoon. <laughs> so steaming and stuff. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, delicious. And. <laughs> <laughs> then Robin is <laughs> is trying to wrap up Flo's hand, uh, and she and he says, "You know, we're gonna get through this." And Florence says, "There's no we in this. Like, have you not been paying attention to what our father's plans are here? We are not a team. Nobody is aligned here, and if they are, they're foolish." And at this point, the bell rings to announce <laughs> that the game. Thing, yeah, let so, the game begin. <laughs> Here in the basement, you'll find a series of wires hanging from this. That's um, like how the fuck he set this up in his basement. Is the idea this is some escape room shit. You know, what I mean, this is this is the as movie plausible escape room, as yeah. the movie the, like, escape room champion of tournaments or tournament of champions or whatever pitch that was. <laughs> this is that level. I'm sure they have that. This is the train sequence at the beginning of 
tournament of champions where everything in the train's fucking electrified and they have to press a certain combination. This is it. Yeah. So this is a an obstacle course where the oh, easiest uh, obstacle course I have ever seen in my and the fact anyone falls here, Bo, is a sweeping indictment. None of the gaps are that big that you would not be able to cross them. Yeah, so it's a bunch of raised platforms. You got to jump without touching the floor. You got to jump across to the other side of the room. The real <laughs> it's hazard. the floor is lava, but yeah. this time it's the floor is electrified. And, and the big danger is that you have all of these swinging tables, yeah, <laughs> spewing electricity. And so the la and again, it's a, it's a last one loses situation where you don't have to be the first one across. You just can't be the last person. Yeah. You have to get across and press the red buzzer button. Yeah. And the last one to do it is the loser. And Dawn, once more, yeah. being the best character of the show, says, <laughs> look, I'm not doing this. This is stupid. Yeah. I don't care about this money. I just want to get off this island. But... I'll I'll play judge and jury here. So, and the way she puts it is, is everyone else ready to suffer pointlessly? Yes, great line, great yeah. line. And, and I think she's speaking to the viewers of Slasher as well. <laughs> uh, I so, think it's directly to us. I think she breaks the fourth wall. Uh, shout out once more to the actress Paula Brancati who plays uh, Dawn. And yeah, is... just keep bringing her back. That that's all I want. I want I want her. You can get rid of everybody else that's ever been in Slasher. Yeah, she is the only character I care about. Um, I hope next time she gets to be the killer because oh. she has earned it. Like she she needs yeah, to, yeah. she needs to level up. Like her final yeah, yeah, form yeah. is going to be the killer. Final form like Pokemon. <laughs> yeah, correct. <laughs> and anyway, so she she counts down. The race is on. A bunch of hopping across blocks happens. Vincent falls. He has to start over. Um, Theo ends up helping Vincent once he gets. Well, back. this he looks and says, "Is there any? Is there anything in there that says that I can't help someone across?" And Don basically says, "No." It just says the last one is the loser. So, yeah. and there's a point where Robin is kind of lagging behind, and Grace offers her. Hand. No, it's a, it's, o it's O'Keefe. Oh yeah, it's O'Keefe. Yeah. Sorry, and O'Keefe yep. says. Come on, take my hand and and I can help you. And Robin refuses it. Yeah, makes the jump, falls. He and it turns out everybody gets across, but Robin. But like the reason we we get the flashback to, like just before this, we get the flashback to him. This is post the gazpacho thing, so we now see him fooling around with the maid, and they have nasty sex, bro. Oh, nasty yeah. loud sex. Which, by the way, if you want to try and keep that a secret, that's not how you do it. Yeah, it's yeah. They're just kind of giggling about the fact that she was fucking with Grace's food, yeah. And she's like, "That's so terrible." What they said about George Michael <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> yeah. And and yeah, so they have the nasty sex, but it turns out, Duncan, somebody they, is they live in a Clue house. <laughs> right. They live in the house from Clue. This is the, like one of these things where I was like, "That yes, these are the details that I want all the way through the show that they're yeah. only giving me at episode three. Cronenberg manages to move one of the sockets from the the electrical outlet, and it's just his creepy old man eye just like watching him. Fuck. <laughs> yeah, one hand on on the hole, one hand on his crank. Yeah, one hand on the hole, one hand on his pole. Yeah. Um, that's that's exactly how that goes. Like, it's a real. This is my rifle. This is my gun. <laughs> so he this, watches. This is for fun. This is for fun. But this is what this is what I this, I, I find this like. To me, this is kind of funny. Like what I like, this is what I pictured in my head, and I was howling, laughing. Right? Was that like they're they're obviously they're having nasty sex, and Cronenberg, like for some reason, like I'm going to find out what's going on here. So he goes into these secret passage and looks like looks through the people, and he's like that. What the fuck? And he's like, ah, so he gets up, and he tries to run. He's just like running, but he can't get the door open. And he finally gets the door open, and he's like, ah, and it opens the door, and then opens the door just as the sun comes. Right, and he busts in and he's like, "You stupid son of yep. a bitch!" Yep. And you know, Grace, uh, uh, not Grace, but Liv's mom, you know, kind of grabs her shit and runs out. And he says something about, "Haven't you? you I don't, I don't, I don't like, like, haven't we given you family. enough?" Kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like she's like, "Ooh," and she runs out the room, and then he gives his son a strong dressing down. And he some thinks he's done the right thing. He's like, "Surely you must be proud, Dad." 
I slept with a woman. And yeah. he's like that. Mm, like, you I could sleep with any fucking woman. D- d- right. Don't sleep with the help. Also, did you use a condom? Did you come says, inside her? Don't sleep with the person that cleans your toilet. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Lassie. Lassie. <laughs> um, but then he's like, did you... Did he say, well, you know, uh, this is the scene you're going to have to use as the intro to this episode as well. He says, "Did you use a comment? Uh, did you use a condom?" And they said, "Did you come inside her?" Which is a sentence I never want to hear from an eighty-plus-year-old David Cronenberg. I just it's creepy and it's weird. See, that's and- where we're different. That's all I want. To hear. <laughs> I want to hear him getting, you know, absolutely mechanical. I don't want like I. I just imagine that "come" is not a word that Cronenberg says. It's ejaculate. Yeah. Right. You know I mean, because, it's, yes, it's, yes, it's, yes, it's yes. the dialogue's just weird. That's as those words coming at his mouth from what that David Cronenberg would never say that. Why are you making him say that? And David Cronenberg hits this guy full fist. Oh, it, yeah, is, yeah. It, it is a womp in the chops. Yeah. And he says, Don't trust anyone. You know, like the yeah. fact fe- you, you have basically made yourself vulnerable now. Yes. And if she's pregnant, right. And then. so later on, uh, back to the present, Dawn is once more the voice of reason trying to explain to Robin, like, you're done now. All of this yeah. money bullshit, like, we're good. Well, and- yeah, it's not, it's not only that he falls, but when he falls, like, people then start walking on his back to get over him yeah. which is just it's fucking great it's just like absolutely it's like insult to injury and all the rest of them they all get across and they all press the button and they're all looking at him and like you see Don's outcome of this is listen that's a, we're finished with this now we don't it's not a concern anymore we don't need to worry about it we've got our orphan kid who's clearly a 60 year old we're <laughs> like look at her look at her just now she's eating the the electricity wire like just she's just raw dog in that electricity wire like i love her you love her we just found that you've got another kid that's great we can try and make a connection with her we don't need to worry about this money stuff anymore robin let it go and he's his concerns are twofold one yes. he is worried that he is now marked for death because oh, but i mean yeah because yeah. he failed <laughs> right the other thing is he says as soon as we get home you're going to leave me because i don't have this family fortune anymore. Yeah. And she's like, have you not been listening to anything I've said? Is that really what you think of me? Yeah. Also, does he have a family? For, like my understanding was from a previous conversation, he doesn't get any money or an yeah. allowance from his dad. Right. He gave up the seat the, the, on, the, on board the board to Jane. So, what, so... What, what family fortune here is she hanging around for? Maybe potentially a will? Right. I guess. And, but you know, clearly because Dawn is the best. She's yeah. like, I don't care about any of that. I just want all of us to leave this place yeah, with I'm our lives. To leave alive. <laughs> and then yeah. go home and just, like, what, we both have to work now? Who gives a shit? Like, that's every every other family ever. Yeah, you know? yeah. And so he's like, I'm poor now. And Dawn says, you know, you're more than your money, right? Like, that is not your personality. Yeah. And then he just stalks out the room because he's terrible. Yeah, because we're going to get once again just like just to cement the fact that he is just like a chip off the old block we then get a flashback to like basically the the maid coming in and she's like hey sorry i haven't had a chance to speak to you since we slept slept together and i'm listen i'm i'm sorry about that but i'm not sorry about what we did and um robin reaches into a drawer and is like i've got a gift for you like i know that you can't afford this is such a oh, fucking, it's, it's in Canada worst. as well. It's in Canada, which means it's public health care, which means it doesn't cost anything. Um, she's like, you know, I've got this present. I know you don't have a lot of money, but here you go. And he hands her a box, which we don't see what it is at first, but if you're savvy, you know what it is. And then he's like, as she's turning around and looks and sees it's basically the morning after pill. Um, he's like that. Oh, by the way, that shirt that I like, you know, the one with the pleats and all the rest like that. Is that has it been dry cleaned? Is it ironed? Because I'm you know, I really need to wear it. Thanks. Bye. It's it's a real jackass move. Yeah, the the yeah. whole emergency conception uh, box that he hands. I mean, it's just once again proving like uh, you cannot have any sympathy for any of these characters. Yeah, just and zero. also just like one hundred percent solidifying the fact she ain't fucking taking that, you prick. Right. 
This like, is a spite baby now. This is spite baby. Oh, absolutely. Like, why on earth would you... Right. She might have been amenable if you had said, like, look, here's yeah. the situation. I enjoyed it, too. We had a great time. But I'm not ready to be a father. Yeah. I, you know, we need to work together. Like, play the good <laughs> I, guy. Yeah, I'm not ready to be a father because if the timelines work out right here, I'm 15 years old. Uh, yeah. so, <laughs> this fucking show is just... And also have Kingdom. a little bit of your father's tact and understand yeah. like you need to play this situation a certain way. And once it's resolved, you can be an asshole and tell her that you need some shirts cleaned. But yeah. until you get the outcome that you're looking for, you need yeah. to play nice. Yeah. Uh, anyway. So, right. So then there's this little scene where Liv's mom and Grace are talking about how great it felt to get Florence's ass. <laughs> um but also acknowledge like well but it was kind of fleeting because now Liv is missing yeah and grace tries to comfort Liv's mom by saying you know she's probably fine she's she's probably yeah, she's probably i think she says she's probably finding a way to get us off the island right our military. and so then we get kind of our final scene of the episode where o'keefe and dawn are hanging out in Dawn and Robin's bedroom. Yeah. And they're as they're chatting, Robin approaches and hears them talking through the door, but can't co totally make it out. So he opens up, as you said, this clue style secret passageway that we did. There's a hundred, this, this show went a hundred percent clue. And I am down to clown on that. <laughs> And yes, I was so happy when I was like, there's secret passages in this. This opens up a whole new level of fun. Yeah. So and we got the early implication with the David Cronenberg thing, but now yeah. we see that it is a straight up like people under the stairs. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Labyrinth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, the um, he goes through, he peeps through the same peephole that his dad was a peeping. Uh, a while ago, and uh, yeah, and he overhears the conversation, and uh, is basically once again confirming that Don is a, a pure good on this show, and she's like, "Listen, I I love him. Like, I would do anything for him." And I'm like, "Yeah, we're like, I will one hundred percent be with him when we get back." You know, this is not a he thinks I'm going to leave him. I'm not going to do that. Um, you know, I, I love him. I'm with him. Like it's never about the money. I, I, I you know, that's it. And he's like, "Oh." Um, his heart grew three sizes that day, Bo, um, as he's as he's sitting on the other side, and then they're like, well, she's like, I'm, I need to go, and Keith's like, well, listen, we're going as, like, in pairs, because I ain't walking around this house myself, and she's like, cool, so they walk out, and Robin's sitting there in the basking glow of knowing someone loves him. Yeah, weeping like a child as yes. his wife goes in search of their orphan uh, foster daughter. <laughs> What is she eating now, Bo? <laughs> right. Uh, Probably found that finger. Um, and and as, as they take off, uh, there's like a beat of him crying, and then the door yeah. opens again, and in comes the killer. Dr. Death. Dr. Death in full <laughs> Dr. Death. Dr. Death regalia. Yep. And starts going through a bunch of drawers. Mm -hmm. And then... Because Robin can't keep his full mouth shut. Also, it's worth saying as well, during during the scene where O'Keefe came to the door, we saw Don carrying a poker, which, mm -hmm. like, Chekhov's poker. You knew it was going to get used. Like, you know, like as, soon as, I, as soon as I knew there was an eyeball that was peering through that hole and that poker had a large spike on the end, I knew exactly what was going to happen to Robin. And this show did not disappoint. Yeah, yeah. Well, once again, the things that Slasher does well, and it's one does thing. Does real well. Yeah, it, it does, does real well. It does that one thing well. <laughs> and uh, so, sure enough, he's, you know, like gasping behind the wall and the killer comes close, but then kind of goes out of frame and he's like, Oh, Oh, <laughs> where, where'd the killer go? And then it, through the hole in the wall comes the fire poker, <laughs> Chekhov's fire poker. Yep. That stabs Robin right through, his eye. right through the eye, through the back of his skull. Yep. The killer kind of winds it around a little bit. Yeah. Just making sure he's good and dead. Bro. Yeah. And then <laughs> you're going to walk this one off. <laughs> right, yeah, it's not not gonna rub some dirt on it and be all right. Um, <laughs> and then yanks the fire poker back out with the eyeball speared on the end. Yeah, and Robin falls down dead. Credits. 
Yes. So Robin is gone. Gone, yeah. gone, gone, ladies and gents. And the show will have you believe that Dr. Trend Medicine Woman is also dead. Uh, <laughs> she's Trend not. Man. She's not fucking dead. Uh, Dr. Trend is 100% alive. And I am once again reaffirming my position that she's the killer. We did not see her fall. And the the thing we found was a necklace which didn't have any blood on it or anything just happened to be lying there fine the only thing that survived from the mangled corpse to clean boat is too clean plus we have not seen the body of the fisherman yet which makes me think it's him um yeah in the in the wood chipper you mean yeah i think she i think she staged that i think she ran there staged the whole thing hoping that she would bait what's her what's her tits and they're throwing a, a stick at her and then she would fake fall that uh, is laugh. some twisted logic though all right here's what i'm gonna do i'm going think, to run to the wood chipper then i'm because i know Flo is crazy I'm i think but i think she's been baiting her it, yeah i mean i don't every disagree every conversation that. has been super antagonistic against Flo, sure and specifically about her money i think she's baiting her because she knows she's an easy target and she will play that game so yeah, again, I don't I don't disagree that the this is the kind of show where that logic holds up. A hundred percent makes sense. Like yeah. an Aaron Martin, he's like, Eureka, I've done it again. <laughs> you know, another another master plan. Um, but like that's that's what I think. I imagine um we will find Robin's body in the next episode, because that seems to be the way things are going. And then what do we think? Florence might be next? I, I was absolutely... You took the, the words out of my mouth. I was going to say Florence is probably the next... Because you next take that go. whole level out. And you and don't then, have to do the special effect for the finger. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You, but you take that whole, like, that whole level out of characters, and then it's all the kids. Yeah. And, and right, the that's going to get and, messy. I, some I of think them can they seem okay, but some of them are... I would vote either if florence is my 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 in my heart of hearts i think that's who's yeah. going to go next also could be grace one of those two could be yeah yeah it might not be necessarily a competitor yeah as well so we could find that maybe the maid as yeah florence yeah liz mom I, I as long as it's not dawn as, as soon as dawn goes on this show i am checked the fuck out yeah, she she will as well. I think I think you're right. I think what we're I think we're going to be left with a combination of either Liv and Theo, which seems like the logical one, um, or it's going to be Liv, Theo, Vincent, maybe, and then we get a reveal on Vincent. That I think we're going to get a reveal on Theo. I that don't know why. Fine. I get I, I get I, I, I get a feeling that he's going to be because that's how this show operates. Like, Liv's the only one that has any good light in her, and Theo's going to end up doing something. Or he's he's playing, like, a long con or something with her to try and get it in, and she'll, cl she'll clock it just at the end or something. I don't know. Yeah, I, don't know. I, I like the idea of Theo just playing the nice guy up until the I think last he is. I, I, think he, I think he is. I think he's specifically playing the nice guy with the people... Well, with everyone there, but I think he's specifically doing it with Liv because Liv's got army training. So... And that's who I would make friends with in anything to do with physical contests is the person that, you know, actually does something physically. So yeah. I would 100% align myself with her. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'm with you. I, I think that, hey, in two weeks, we'll know. Do you think we'll ever get the, the a better story as to what happened with Vincent? Do you think they're going to go there? Or oh, do you yes. Think that's, I'm hoping so. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think the whatever family it was that Vincent was living with and that kind of thing, I think that's all going to be critical. Cool. You know? Cool. Cause, cause I, I, need, I need that at and, this stage. You know what I mean? Listen, if I gave you my full orphan theory, it's that the orphan had a relationship with Vincent. Oh. And that... They are secretly gaming all of this. Ooh, see if they do that, I would respect the show if they did that. That's why it won't. It can't possibly be. I true. can't be. That's why it's one hundred percent the dead doctor. Yeah, uh, it's one hundred percent is the dead doctor. It's um, and Don like solved it. Right. What three episodes in? Um, so yeah. I don't know. It was a really bad episode. Once again, like you see, I had an, I had an entertaining sequence with the fight in the kitchen, which was fun. 
to watch. But once again, it's 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 clumsy when dealing with class politics. It's clumsy when dealing with racism. The it's reveal clumsy. of the of of uh, Liv's parentage is super clumsy. Yeah, like that is yeah, the, the word reveal of Robin being head. homosexual is just terrible. Right. It's it's just. It feels unnecessary when you're just going to kill that character could, off anyway. Yeah, could, yeah. Could it could it have been them like in the room making out with a guy? Does it have to be hardcore fucking penetrative sex? Oh, he's a gay character. This is what they do. You well, know what I mean, it's that sort of thing that I just, I, I it's, everything has to be done on a kind of tactless, gratuitous level, right? And slasher that there's no way. There's no way that you could reveal, like, like you said before, there's no way like, that a character could just be an ordinary person, but just say something in a sentence which would allow the audience to understand that. No, we physically have to see someone being railed in order to understand that they're gay. And, and also, it and just... That sort of stuff I fucking hate, man. It just doesn't matter because the, the character's gone anyway, and all it does this is... This episode! It's yeah. a reveal that adds nothing to the character at all. Yeah. Doesn't add to his motivation for being estranged. Like, see if they played into my dad never accepted that, and that's why I distanced myself from the business because he wouldn't ever understand that, and then I had to force myself into a marriage where I couldn't get up. Uh, because I wasn't attracted to this woman, which is why we had to get it. Like, a, if, if we'd spent time crafting that out, but no, we don't get that. It's clumsily flung in in a 40 minute episode where it's just flung there. A couple of mentions about George Michaels, because, you know, he was gay, and then he's dead at the end of the episode. Oh, Slasher works. Here's done. It's just fucking, it's crass. It's crass. It, yeah, it's terrible. It, it's yeah. uh, uh, the show. Well, like I said, we've only got. <laughs> Uh, the uh, you know al almost halfway through the season. Yeah. Next, next, next time we will be halfway through. Yeah. And I will be on the official countdown for the last four episodes. All right. So Duncan, then. Yes. Um, if you would, how about you tell the lovely people at home, uh, where they can get more out of you, and I don't mean just money. <laughs> if you want to get more out of me send me an email claiming to be a nigerian prince um, <laughs> works every time every single time um yeah if you want to check out more stuff that i'm doing podcast under the stairs is the main show at the moment we're doing loads of stuff it's very kind of all over the place but loads of fun content out there uh, diversifying i think is what they call it um diversifying the portfolio this, yeah Yes, always, always. Uh, and the Teapots Collective, where we're doing Where to Begin With, which is uh, looking at film noir and neo-noir movies. Just dropped the first assignment for the listeners, which is Chinatown uh, by Roman Polanski from 74. Chinatown, yes. China. Um, and the movie number two, Strangers on a Train. Oh, going a little bit, how good. Going a little uh, bit Hitchcock. Um, Crisscross. Uh, Yes, so, uh, we're doing that, um, doing the nasty, the episode that will be out very soon is covering the movie that I mentioned earlier on, GBH, which is awful, and a movie called Naked Fist, aka Firecracker, which is a Roger Corman produced Taiwanese feminist martial arts movie. All right. The main character played Fonzie's girlfriend in Happy Days. And she gets her boobies out. It's interesting. It's not very good. Um, but once again, it's an hour and 15 minutes long. Yeah. That's how you do it. That's how you do it. Uh, so we're doing that. Uh, Opera Omnia will be coming back in just under a month. And Chronicle has just put an episode covering Dario Argento's Inferno. All that stuff can be found at tputzcast.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. Excellent. And if you want to hear uh, more out of me, you can always go over to legionpodcasts.com where you can find not only this show, Duck and Bo Come Correct, uh, but you can find uh, The Dark Parade, which is all the horror stuff I do uh, with lots of bonus episodes under that feed. Um, including what turned into an hilarious conversation with Kate Pollock on a bonus episode called Heart of Horror, uh, mm -hmm. where we talked about Happy Death Day and One Night Stands. And we got a listener story, Duncan, that involved Cunnilingus on a first date. Uh -huh. and that was one of the most horrifying things I've ever heard. Oh, wow. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So you can find that over on the Dark Parade, also available anywhere uh, you can find uh, podcasts in general. 
And uh, last but not least, you can find me on uh, Pick 6 Movies, where me and uh, my buddy Chad Cooper uh, talk about um, yeah, bad movies. We pick six movies based around <laughs> a, a common theme. Uh, this season, we are doing a season entitled Die Hard Ons, yes. which uh, are Die Hard ripoffs. And uh, up next on the slate is we'll be talking about both um, uh, Sudden Death with Jean-Claude Van Damme. Yeah, yeah. And then after that, Passenger 57 with Wesley Snipes. So Always Bat and Black, Bolt. Always Bat and Black. Yeah, that is a movie that has a whole lot of nothing. Um, Yeah, it's it's it's, it's a whole lot of Wesley Snipes is a great guy, but do we need them on a plane? Uh, like... Also, why are we just going to the circus for no reason? How about that? Uh, but yeah, we that's that's a good time. Um, <sighs> so anyway, you can find all that stuff. Like I said, legionpodcasts.com or you can find those just anywhere you get a podcast. Google and uh, Android and iHeartRadio, Pod Sniffer. <laughs> Are you just like looking around your house now and just picking things? Are you are you doing a Kaiser Sozi right I now? I love lamp. <laughs> you can find it over there on I love lamp. Um, but anyway, there is nothing left to do in this particular episode uh, other than to say we'll be back in two weeks' time for another episode of Duncan and Bo slash fiction and to tell my good friend Duncan, say goodnight, Duncan. And to tell my good friend Duncan, say goodnight, Duncan. That's not, doesn't even work. That's how we do it. Uh, Stop it. Stop. Look at the dog. The dog's like, what's he doing?